I think we're at live. All right. I can't hear you. Hello. Uh, now you're on. Yeah, you're muted there for a second. <laughs> Hello, everyone. A very good evening to all. I can see a lot of us have joined. So we feel very glad and honored to welcome our respectable guests for the evening, Dr. Sue Royapa. So Dr. Sue is a physician with around 20 years of experience treating patients in the US. As the chief health officer for the city of Hideaway in Texas, she's active, actively involved in COVID antibody testing, maintains the vaccine database, and educates the community on safely living in COVID times without fear and despair. She has also successfully managed several COVID patients and will share her expertise today on how to take care of yourself and your family members with COVID at home, since most people today do not need hospital treatment. 
So Dr. Ayopa is uh, a co-founder of Dallas Medical PLLC. She completed her internal medicine residency at Presbyterian Hospital of Dallas. She attended the Purdue University receiving her BSc in physics. And Dr. Royapa was a high school mathematics teacher and instructor of mathematics at Millsaps College before entering medical school at the University of Mississippi. The countless accolades that she has received for her immense work is something that really inspires us. And we can't wait to listen to her guiding us today on the topic, be prepared for Corona, reduce fear and find hope. So let's uh, welcome Dr. Sue, over to you. Thank you so much, uh, Ria. It is a pleasure and a privilege to be here today. Um, I was talking to you all about a year ago when this first happened, and I know several of you may have watched me at that time. And things have become very different uh, in that one year. We've uh, learned a lot. Uh, and hopefully that will help me bring some clarity today. So I'm gonna go ahead and switch to my mode and I'm gonna talk for a while. And uh, it'll take probably about 30 minutes or so to, and then once we're done with that part, I'm gonna go back to you because I know that several people from Successive have already sent you some questions. We can answer right. that. And uh, after that, we will open it up to the live session as well. So in case there are things that we have not covered, we'll try our very best for the audience to, for me to go ahead and answer as many questions as possible. Now, if we do run out of time uh, and you still have more questions, then you can definitely reach me uh, through my website. There's a contact there, suroyapamd.com. And I'll give you that information. Maybe you can put that somewhere for them or send it to them via email. And the other thing also that I've noticed in the past when I give talks like this, there's so much information, it's hard to remember all of that. Mm -hmm. So there are two ways for people to come back and listen to it. One is that we are gonna have a recording of this live session on the YouTube uh, mm -hmm. channel that you see right now. So if you have this link, just come back to the same link and it'll be available. But at other times, we also don't have the time to listen to you know 30 minute mm -hmm. video. So I have a link to our Health Secure uh, Foundation organization, which is our uh, NGO. Uh, you can go there and there is everything is written, whatever we're talking about, about treatment at home. Uh, there's a list of the medicines and the list of how to take care of things at home there. So you can quickly, what I've had some of my uh, patients as well as family members, they just make a printout of that and like put it on their fridge or on their table so that if something happens, then they have it ready. So the most important thing is to be prepared because when you're prepared, then your uh, anxiety is low, your fear is low. There is one thing that I always mention and that is be prepared for the worst, but hope for the best. And that's what we're gonna do today, all right? Okay, we'll see you in a little bit. Um, everybody at Successive, uh, thank you so much for coming and it is Again, as I said, I am so honored to be here, to be sharing whatever knowledge I have uh, with you uh, so that this becomes not a time of fear. Uh, in the one year, uh, India has gone from doing relatively, you know, actually very well to now in a difficult situation. Uh, there is a lot of fear. There is a lot of confusion. Uh, you are hearing mixed messages from all sides. You are here, you know, you may be hearing something from the newscaster, you're seeing something in the on TV, hearing something else on radio, then your dudwala is saying something, then your neighbor is saying something, uh, your friends are saying something. Then you hear different things coming to you from WhatsApp, from Facebook. You don't know what to believe and what to trust. So I'm hoping that today, as a physician who has dedicated this past year to treating patients with COVID in India remotely. I've treated many, many patients in India. Uh, I am uh, also doing a lot of work here in the community, educating our community uh, about uh, COVID. So I hope that me bringing this information to you will once and for all put all the rumors to rest and we can focus on the true information, the real information, and we can use that to reduce fear. Okay, so the first myth that is out there is, uh, you know, there are like these two different extremes of people that are on the planet right now. 
And I think they're there in India as well. I don't know about Delhi, but they're definitely there in Tamil Nadu because my family is, I have two groups. One group says, oh, this coronavirus is nothing. It's all in people's head. You know, people are going to be dying anyway. So I'm not going to worry about it. That's one group. And then on the other side, you have this other group that is terrified, absolutely terrified, because they think that if you get coronavirus, then you're going to die. And that you are going to be really sick. You're going to be in the intensive care unit. That you are going to have, you have to be in the ICU. And they are terrified to even step outside the door because they think that, you know, this coronavirus is going to come and kill them right away. The truth of the matter is somewhere in between. So for the people that are saying that this is nothing, I want them to know that lakhs and lakhs of people are dying in this world from coronavirus. So this is not nothing. This is serious and we need to address it. You need to be careful. You need to protect yourself and you need to protect your family. And for the people that are saying that, oh, if I get coronavirus and I'm going to die and are so scared, I want to give them a piece of information that 99.9% .9 of people who get coronavirus infection recover. Okay. So most of the time, so less than 1%. So the anywhere between, you know, under 1%. So 1%, unfortunately, when you have a large population, you know, in India has 137 crore population, 1% 1 of that is 137 lakhs. So it's still a large number of people. But I don't want you to be afraid that if you get coronavirus, that you're going to be severely sick. In fact, 40% of people, 40% of people that get infected with coronavirus don't even know that they have coronavirus. They may just have a test because, you know, their father or mother got sick and they, they got tested and they're positive, but they feel perfectly fine. No symptoms, no fever, no chills, no cough, nothing. So 40% of people, nothing. And then 80% of the people who get coronavirus can be treated at home safely and effectively. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about how to be prepared at home for the coronavirus. Okay. So if 80% can be treated at home, then only 20% of people would need to go to the hospital. So we will talk about as, uh, later on as well about how do you know when you need to go to the hospital. Okay. Now, as far as taking care of coronavirus at home, you need to be aware of what the symptoms are. So the symptoms are fever. Again, not everybody gets fever. About 30 to 40% of people who test positive for coronavirus will not have fever. But if you have a fever, you may have a cough, you may have sore throat, you may have nasal congestion, uh, body aches, headache. Now, these are all things that you have all experienced with a normal cold or with a regular flu. So this is exactly how it is for a lot of people, okay? Some people may also have some stomach issues, and usually it's diarrhea. We're not seeing a lot of vomiting. We're seeing more diarrhea. So you may have some stomach symptoms. But again, you've had diarrhea. If you're in India, you've had diarrhea, and you know how to take care of it. So these symptoms of fevers, headache, cough, and diarrhea, we know how to take care of them, and I'll remind you how to take care of them. But there are a couple of other symptoms that you may have, and that is relatively specific, and one is loss of smell and loss of taste. You've probably all heard of that. Uh, there's no treatment for that. You're not gonna lose your taste and uh, smell for the rest of your life. Most people will get it back within um, you know, a couple of weeks. Sometimes it takes a couple of months, but you will get that back. Now, the serious symptoms are shortness of breath, chest pain, stroke-like symptoms. Now, those things happen in a small percentage of people. But when those happen, then you need to get immediate medical attention. So some ways that you can prepare for COVID before your become positive or a family member becomes positive is to make sure you have certain medications at home. This list will be posted on healthsecure.org uh, and you can go get that. So don't need to remember it. But for fever, you need to have some paracetamol, 500 milligrams. 
This is only for adults. For anything that I'm saying now is for healthy, normally healthy adults. If you have chronic medical problems like you know severe heart disease or you're on a, a you know any kind of special regimen, make sure and talk to your doctor. And also if you have children, because the age of the child and the weight of the child will affect the type of medication that you can give. So paracetamol 500. Make sure for fever, headache. Um, uh, you know, body aches, that kind of thing. You can take up to four times a day. Uh, make sure you have plenty of liquids and fluids because when you have fever, it, it, it the the moisture evaporates, so you become dehydrated very quickly. And dehydration can be a big problem, especially early on. Um, in in late later stages, the oxygen level will can fall, and that is very serious. But in the beginning, you can get yourself into a lot of trouble if you don't drink water. A lot of Indians don't drink a lot of water, at least in my family, they don't. So make sure you drink a lot of water. The second thing you need to have is ORS or oral rehydrate, rehydration solution. That is if you have diarrhea so that when you have diarrhea, then you can go ahead and make sure you take this ORS one or two cups of it after you have diarrhea. Um, the other thing that you can make sure and have are some of the devices. So a thermometer. Uh, now, if you don't have it, if you, I would recommend go find these things. So a thermometer and a pulse oximeter. Some of you, I'm sure many of you have already heard about it. It's a little machine that you clip onto your finger. So obviously not everybody can have a pulse oximeter because there's not that many pulse oximeter out there available right now. And there may be some fake ones going around. So make sure you get a good one. If you don't have one, have one in the family that people can share. So for example, I have families in four different cities in India. So I put one in each city so that the families in that city can share. So the normal, if you put the pulse oximeter, it tells you the oxygen level. The normal oxygen level is between 95 and 100. So anything below that, then we need to say, okay, this is starting to get a little bit serious. We need to start talking to our doctors. We need to start making preparations for the hospital. Um, the other thing that I want to make sure that you have is if you are a, uh, if you're having a, a lot of diarrhea, or if you are a person who takes medication for blood pressure, or if you are taking medication for diabetes, then two machines that help you to uh, have at home are a blood pressure monitor and a glucose monitor. Uh, and those are both available in the market. And again, everybody can't have one. So maybe you can share it with your friends and family when needed because those will help you monitor. When you're having an infection, if you're a diabetic, your blood sugar is going to go higher than normal. So it's good to check your sugar and talk to your doctor and say, you know what? I have coronavirus, but my sugars are going up. Normally it's like 150, but now it's 300. So they can make adjustments. Similarly, if you're dehydrated, your blood pressure could go down. So you check your blood pressure. And if your blood pressure is low, you can call your doctor and say, you know what, doctor, normally, you know, my blood pressure runs 120, but now it is running at 95. So if there are things like that, make sure that you're prepared for all of these things. Now, there are lots of um, myths about what to use at home, you know, flooded in the internet that you can use this vegetable or this uh, herb or this yeast vitamin or this injection. We do not, I repeat, we do not have any medicine right now that prevents or cures coronavirus. If anybody tells you otherwise, they are not telling you the truth. So when we are desperate, we are like, oh my gosh, let's do anything to prevent this from happening to us. We're willing to try all kinds of things, you know? And in that situation, a lot of people have actually caused themselves harm. Uh, you know, hydroxychloroquine, azithromycin, ivermectin, um, so there's another one going around in India. I think it starts with an I, Fapinavir or something like that. All these antivirals. We have had time to test all of them for a whole year. In the beginning, when I came to you one year ago, we were trying some of these things because at that time we didn't know what was going to work and what was not going to work. We've had a year to try them out. And right now, none of these things work. In fact, if you take medications that don't work, they're not harmless. 
Because if you take azithromycin and you are already on other medications that may interact with it, you may have problems. When people were taking hydroxychloroquine and they took uh, the uh, you know incorrect dosages, actually there were a couple of people that got into really bad trouble and some of them may even have died. So please be very careful to know that currently there is no medication that you can run out to the pharmacy and get and say, this is going to cure me. Okay. There's been one thing that has been going around in the uh, WhatsApp and that is steam inhalation. And there have been reports on some really dangerous things happening with steam inhalation, because if you real steam inhalation, so you just put water and you're inhaling it, the steam, that is okay. But the only thing it works for is nasal congestion. It doesn't do much for your lungs. If by, if your lungs are already bad by then nasal steam is not going to do anything. But what people are doing are putting eucalyptus oil, lemon oil, and other types of oils into the water and then inhaling it. And that is actually very dangerous because those uh, droplets of oil can be aerosolized and go in microscopic particles into your lungs and they are causing lung damage. So please do not do that kind of stuff at home. Okay. Um, let me see There's if I've done everything. All right. So one thing, remember, if at home, if you are positive, I'm sure you all know this, but I'm going to say it again, you must isolate. That means you need to go into a different room by yourself and people who come to give you food, they need to you know, wear a mask when they come in uh, and wash their hands very well when they come in. And you need to be isolated for a minimum of 10 days and you should not have fever for 24 hours before you come out of the room. Now, the rest of the people in the family who've been exposed to you, they should be in quarantine. Quarantine is they don't have any symptoms, but they've been exposed. And they need to not go out of their house for a minimum of 14 days. So remember, if you are positive and you're having symptoms, fever, cough, chills, body aches, then you will be in isolation for 10 days at least until your fever goes out for at least 24 hours with no paracetamol. If you're a family member, then you need to be in quarantine. That means you don't leave the house for 14 days. So that is very, very important. So when do you need to go to the hospital? So this is important because you're monitoring, right? I now told you, you need to be checking your temperature. Now, don't be checking your temperature constantly or walk around with your pulse oximeter on your finger the whole time. You know, that's not needed. So check your temperature when you're feeling bad. When you're feeling bad, you're feeling achy, you're sweaty, and you're like, oh my gosh, do I have a fever? And again, just because you have a small fever, you know, of 99.5, uh, I don't know what that is in centigrade, you don't need to pop a paracetamol. So when do you, you take the paracetamol when your temperature is 38 um, uh, degrees, and that is 100.4 or higher, or if you're feeling bad and achy. So check your temperature periodically. Same thing with the uh, pulse oximeter. You don't need to be checking it constantly. You check it three times a day, morning, afternoon, and night. Obviously, check it if you're having trouble breathing. If you're feeling short of breath, check your pulse ox or your, ox uh, your oxygen level. But if your oxygen level is normal, okay, so it's saying 98%, that's normal. But if you're, if you're having this kind of reaction, I can't take a breath. That is something that you need to get medical attention for, okay? So shortness of breath. The other thing is coronavirus itself can cause blood clots. So it, the blood clot can go get lodged in the lung and it can get lodged in the heart. It can get lodged in the brain. So if you have symptoms of chest pain, you know, so, you know, do, but they normally don't have any chest pain and suddenly now you're having chest pain, uh, chest heaviness or sharp pain when you take a breath, when you take a deep, deep breath, there's a sharp, sharp pain. Uh, those are all indications and not like one time. Sometimes we get so scared, there's anxiety. But if every time you're taking a breath, you're getting sharp pains in your chest, then you need to think maybe there's a blood clot and you need to take care and go to the hospital. Any signs of paral you know, paralytic attack, like paralysis, your face is not moving properly, can't smile or show your teeth, or you're slurring your speech, anything like that, that goes to the hospital. If your fever becomes very high, so 39 degrees and higher, and you cannot bring it down even after taking paracetamol, then that is something you need to go to the hospital for. 
or if you're getting very dehydrated, so your diarrhea is going, you are unable to drink water because you want to throw up, you have nausea, you, and you can get very quickly dehydrated, especially children and older people and people who have diabetes, they can get dehydrated very quickly. And dehydration is so simple to fix, you know, by just simply going, drinking water. If you can't drink water or ORS, then you need to go get drips of saline in, in the hospital. Very easy to fix, but so many complications can arise if you are dehydrated. So those are some of the most important things of when you should go to the hospital. Now, unfortunately in India, we've gotten to a situation where a lot of my family that I've been treating and patients, uh, they are having a shortage of beds uh, and a shortage of oxygen and oxygen is life-saving. Uh, and if you are not able to get to the hospital and let's say it's 95 and you're calling, you're starting to make preparations, you're calling your doctor, you're calling the local hospitals and it's under 95, there are a couple of things that you can do to improve oxygenation, okay? One of the things is called pursed lip breathing. That means you, first of all, pursed means like this, look, you're whistling, like you're going to whistle, okay? I'm going to explain. So you're going to breathe in through your nose and you're going to breathe out through your mouth. When you're breathing in through your nose, your lips will be closed. When you're breathing out, you're going to do this. You're going to breathe out for a longer time than breathing in, okay? So you'll go... Okay, that is improves oxygenation. After you do that for a few times, you can also do something called stomach breathing, where you take your hands and you put it in uh, over your stomach. And when you breathe in, make your stomach come out, make the make your hands come out. Okay, so you'll go. No, you're breathing in now. Blow out your stomach. I can't show you my stomach on the TV, but your stomach needs to go out and you breathe out. So that also breathe out like that. This will help improve oxygenation in your lungs. And lastly, there's something called prone breathing. Again, this is only if your oxygen levels are going lower than 95% uh, and you're not able to get to the hospital. Not everybody can do prone. Prone means you put yourself on your stomach on the bed with your head all tilted. Okay. So you're lying on the bed with your, on your stomach instead of on your back. Not everybody can do that. The person needs to be able to do it themselves so you cannot take nani and dadi and turn them around and put them on the put them on the bed upside down okay on their stomach if nani or dadi can turn themselves around on their own and they're feeling comfortable then they can do that because that also improves oxygenation so these are some of the things that you can do while you're looking for a place in the hospital uh, for a hospital bed for oxygen and so on and so forth now we've talked a lot about when to go to the hospital but once you go to the hospital, there is a lot of myths there right now. And uh, unfortunately, again, uh, there have been misinformation in public, uh, in, uh, in, in the public media and in, the, and in social media. And, and some of the old guidelines, you know, from last year are still floating around. So one big thing that was floating around is plasma. People begging on Twitter and WhatsApp, please give us plasma because doctors are asking for them. And I hope they've quit doing this because the ICMR finally changed its guidelines. No plasma, plasma does not work. We have tried it. We were really, really hopeful that it would work. And we've been trying it for months and it's not working. So if your doctor says bring plasma, tell them to go to the ICMR website, tell them to go to the WHO website, no plasma. The other thing that doctors uh, have been telling and patients have been begging and have been buying in the black market for 40,000, 50,000 rupees is remdesivir. Remdesivir is not a cure. It does not prevent death. And in only very small situations, it helps reduce the number of days you spend in the hospital. So let's say I'm in the hospital without remdesivir, I'm gonna be in the hospital for 14 days. If I take remdesivir in certain situations, very specific situations, I may stay in the hospital for maybe 12 days or 13 days. So that's all it does. And the WHO says, don't give remdesivir to anybody, especially in developing countries where resources are scarce. We need that money to be buying your saline, to be buying your paracetamol, to get your oxygen. 
not to be buying your remdesivir. Okay, so please do not do that. The other thing is all these other tablets like ivermectin, uh, vitamin D, vitamin C. None of those things have been found to help coronavirus. There is only one thing that has been shown to help coronavirus, to reduce death in coronavirus, and that is steroids in the hospital, not at home, not at home. I cannot even imagine how big of a problem. You've probably heard of the black fungus or mucormycosis that's going around in India. That is happening because of many things that are going on. And one big culprit is steroids being used inappropriately. I have been a doctor for 20 years and I have seen two cases, two cases of mucor or black fungus in the entire, in the entire time. And it's the same for my colleagues here as well. And now suddenly in India, you're hearing 50 people here have mucor, 100 people there have mucor. Okay. So the steroids are very powerful drugs. They are, can be life saving, but they can also kill you if you do not know how to use them. So please do not go check on the internet and find out, oh, dexamethasone is a, is a, is a, is a steroid. Methylprednisolone is a steroid. So I'm going to go to the uh, Rambabu ph pharmacy down the street and I'm going to buy that and I'm going to take it. No. And even in the hospital, it's only in patients who have low oxygen. If you give it to them before the oxygen is low, you actually cause harm. So if you've gone to the hospital because you're COVID positive, but you are having diarrhea, but your oxygen is still 99, you should not be given steroids because these un, the only people that get mucor in this country before all of this are in people whose immune systems are low, those really low. We're talking about cancer patients on chemotherapy, organ transplant patients, and diabetics. Diabetics. Mucor he loves be diabetics. Again, doesn't mean that if you're a diabetic, you're going to get it. I've treated thousands of diabetic patients. One patient has got mucor in the entire time, and she was also a cancer patient. Okay, so in when the, another problem is what's happening is when you go into the hospital and doctors are treating you with steroids. A lot of the patients when they go home are not checking their sugars. So if you're on steroids, you need to check your sugars, regardless of whether, especially if definitely if you're a diabetic. If you're a diabetic on insulin, you need to be going home and checking your sugars twice a day after you leave the hospital if you've been taking steroids, because that's when you can have this post-COVID uh, mucor or post-COVID fungus because your sugars get so high and your immunity is low because you are a, a diabetic and then you can end up with this problem. So that's why it's good to have a glucose meter at home if at all possible. Let me check on my time. I think I'm doing all right. Uh, so those are the things, the myths about what's going on in the hospitals. We need to make absolutely sure uh, that you are getting the right treatment. No antivirals. None of the antivirals are currently recommended because they are not working at this point, tablets and stuff. So don't go into the pharmacy and just buy these random things that you read on the internet and take them and cause more trouble because they can interact with, if you're a younger person, it may do nothing, but we don't know. It may interact with your medications. It can interact with your disease process. So we've talked a lot now about the disease of coronavirus, but what we have now compared to before is a big, big, big miracle of science and technology that we didn't did not have last year, and that is vaccines. And normally it takes 10 years to get a vaccine, uh, and the quickest vaccine has been four years. And now we have not one coronavirus vaccine, but multiple safe and effective coronavirus vaccines are now available just within months. And things have just dramatically changed for us here in the United States and in other parts of the world since we've got the vaccines. There are many, many myths about the vaccine. The first myth being that the vaccines do not work and they may not work for new variants. And that is absolutely not true. The vaccines have been found to be very, very effective. The ones that you have there are Covishield and Covaxin. And I think Sputnik V has now recently been um, uh, recently been ordered. Uh, now Covishield, uh, uh, Covaxin and Sputnik, we don't have a lot of data yet. So hopefully we will get some data. 
Covishield has a lot of data because millions of people have used Covishield as the AstraZeneca vaccine in the United Kingdom. So, uh, and we have, uh, it's 80% effective. What does that mean? 80% of the people, if you take the vaccine, two doses, you will not get coronavirus. So that means you can still get coronavirus, right? The 20% of you're running around and being in a big group, you can still get coronavirus, but you will not get severe disease and you will not die. You know, it's very, 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 very rare. And we found the same thing for all the different variants from the UK and from the uh, South Africa and most likely the Indian variant as well, because these vaccines provide what's called cross protection. So even though you get the vaccine, you may get coronavirus, maybe a new variant, but you're not going to be as sick and you're not going to die because of the uh, because of the disease. So this is the most important thing about the vaccine is it doesn't matter if you get coronavirus. You can say, oh, I paid all this money and I got two, uh, two shots and I got coronavirus. But you know what? If you had not taken the vaccine, you might have been very sick. You might have been on the ventilator in the ICU or you may have died. So it's really important to get the vaccines. The second big myth that is going around right now is that the vaccines are dangerous, okay? Now, millions, millions of vaccines have been given out and they have been so safe. But we're hearing this thing, even from my own mother, I had to convince her and convince her to take the vaccine because she's like, my neighbors are telling me they're taking the vaccine, and they're getting a heart attack. This person got a vaccine and got a heart attack. That person took the vaccine and they got a paralytic attack. This boy here, he took the vaccine and he got seizures. You have to think a little bit about this because every minute, every minute, somebody dies from a heart attack in the United States. And in India, the rate is 10 times as much. So at least one person every minute in India is dying of a heart attack, regardless of COVID. So there is no way to say that just because somebody had a vaccine and then had a heart attack, that the heart attack was a result of the vaccine. We have now, like my mother had a heart attack two years ago, very severe heart attack and out of the blue, she had no idea. She was doing perfectly fine and got major heart attack requiring stents and ICU and all of this. Now, if she had taken the vaccine two days before and then she got the vaccine, what would she say? Oh, I took that vaccine and that is why now I got a heart attack. And we know that is not the case. So scientists have been working very hard to separate out which which side effects are actually happening from the vaccine and which are completely unrelated to vaccine, but are just happening in coincidence, right? So there has been one major issue that we've had with the vaccines and the COVID shield. We don't know what if it is happening with Covaxin because we don't have the data yet. We don't know if that's happening with Sputnik because we don't have the data yet. But with COVID shield, one in one lakh, remember, one in one lakh patients are getting a clot. But if they go to the hospital, they don't die. There have been very, 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 very few deaths from the clots of COVID. And most of it has been in patients who did not get treatment uh, uh, very quickly or appropriately or who have been very sick already, okay? One in one lakh. And it is much lower at the, uh, the older you are, okay? So that means young people have a higher risk. So anybody under 40 uh, will have two out of one lakh, two out of one lakh. So still very, very, very small compared to say 1% of people from coronavirus that are dying. 1% means one out of 100. Whereas the side effect is one out of one lakh. So you need to decide, are you willing to take the risk? Because life is full of risks. There is nothing without risk in life. You, I bet you will not even be thinking not even be thinking about getting into your car and going from Noida to, I don't know, Gurga, right? You will not even be thinking. But there's uh, deaths from accidents is, I think, something like one in every four minutes in India. I think there's one accident every second. And I think death is like once every minute, something like that. So that is more, you know, that's a huge amount of people that are dying, but you don't think about it. And you can't come and say, you know, Dr. Sue, are you going to give me 100% guarantee that if I take this vaccine, that nothing is going to happen to me? No, I cannot. Nobody can give you that guarantee. Will you ask the car salesman when you buy the car that, oh, can you give me a guarantee that this will not cause an accident? No, but we still take certain risks when we know that the risks are worth the benefit. And in this situation, 
the vaccine is absolutely worth the benefit. So I uh, right now, the, I hope I've convinced everybody that the vaccine is the only way to get out of this because that is what prevents, you know, it's not easy to directly come up with tons and tons of, you know, the lacks of oxygen concentrators, lacks of ventilators, lacks of be new beds. Those are all very difficult, but it's much easier to get lacks of people vaccinated. Unfortunately, I'm hearing um, uh, uh, news now that there is a shortage of vaccines in India. And I really, really hope that all the leaders and all of you uh, policymakers and everybody there will, uh, you know, really push your community to get these vaccines when they are available. Um, I want to leave you with a small story uh, of Ram Babu. Ram Babu is in a two story house and he is on the uh, living by the river. And the river is flooded and the floodwaters are rising and rising and rising. And Ram Babu goes to his terrace on top and he starts praying to God. He says, Bhagwan, please stop this uh, flood. I, you know, I, uh, save, I want to save my family. Stop the flood. I want to stay, save my house. Uh, and while he's praying, uh, praying to God, the rescue helicopter is coming and it's dropping a ladder. And the guy, the EMT up there is saying, Are Ram Babu, get on the, get on the ladder. I, I, uh, you know, we, we will rescue you. Rambu says, oh, no, 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 I'm not going to get on that ladder. If I get on the ladder, I might fall and I fall into the flood and might die. No, 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 I'm, I'm praying to Bhagwan. Bhagwan is going to make the flood go away. So the helicopter went away and the flood keeps rising and Rab Babu dies and he goes to Swargalog, uh, yeah, uh, heaven. And there he meets a God and he, sa he tells God, I was praying so hard to you and you're telling you to uh, uh, take the flood away, reduce the flood. And you did nothing for me. And I'm such a big, dev big devotee. And God says, Are Ram Babu, what are you talking about? I sent you the helicopter, the rescue helicopter, and even threw, threw you a ladder. But you were too scared to take the ladder. So what can I do? The story of Ram Babu applies to vaccines. We are in a flood of coronavirus. And God, we can all pray to God for uh, there is no harm in praying to God. But God is coming and providing us the helicopter. He is providing us with the ladder. But if we are so scared and say, oh, no, no, I, want, I don't want to climb the ladder and take the vaccine, which is in the helicopter, because I'm scared of the side effects from it, then we are not making use of this wonderful, miraculous thing that we have been given by the scientific community. So I hope that you will realize that the hope of getting out of this is from the vaccine. Because we in the United States, when in, during Christmas time, uh, we were in the worst shape. We, just, we were also worried about uh, ICU beds not being there, bed shortages, all of these things. And then just like a Christmas gift, we got the vaccine. And now 80% drop, 80% drop in our co uh, coronavirus cases and coronavirus deaths. So in Israel, zero deaths, zero deaths since they started vaccinating. So there is hope. If we can do it, India can do it. We have gotten through this. You will get through this. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and switch to, um, um, let me see Ria there. Yes, and thank you so much, by the way, for everybody for patiently listening to me. And we'll now take some questions from Ria and see uh, if we can answer those. Okay. So, hi, everyone. I believe that now, uh, you know, uh, Dr. Sue will answer all our questions. So, not all our questions, you... maybe some of the I don't have all the answers. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Yeah, we'll, we'll, answer, we'll, we'll answer whatever I can answer, I will answer. Sure, sure. So now is the time that you guys can actually put in all your questions on the comment section on YouTube that you see. I see a lot of questions are already there. So I'll start asking. Meanwhile, if you guys have uh, you know, some other questions that you want to ask Dr. Sue, which have already not been answered by her, then please go ahead. So the first question that I would like to ask you uh, is that how soon after the COVID infection can you know, one get vaccinated? That's a very good question, Ria, that somebody submitted because when you get COVID, your body makes antibodies, right? That provide mm -hmm. protection for you. So right now, if you have COVID, you definitely don't want to go get a vaccine immediately because you already are full of antibodies. So minimum, minimum, you need to wait for three months, minimum. 
okay? Mm -hmm. But especially in a vaccine shortage, we want to make sure that we keep the vaccine for people that have no antibodies, right? And mm -hmm. uh, the, the studies are now showing that if you get coronavirus, that many, most of the people are keeping their immunity for almost a year. So uh, my recommendation is if you have had coronavirus, then you, you are going to have a fair amount of protection. So please wait until all the others have been vaccinated. Once India is full of vaccines everywhere, wherever you turn, if there are vaccines, then at that time, if it has been more than three months, preferably more than six months, then you can get vaccinated, but not before that. Go ahead. Okay. Okay. So next, someone wanted to ask was, for how long am I protected post the two doses of vaccine? Okay. Um, so what happens is after the second dose of vaccine, you have to wait for two weeks. So uh, depending on which vaccine you're getting and when it is being uh, separated out, uh, you have to wait for two weeks after your vaccine to get the maximum benefit. That doesn't mean that as soon as you have two weeks, you're going to run out and, you know, have a tamasha and mela and everything because you may still get coronavirus. Uh, just you will not get seriously ill. But this protection, how long is it going to last? We don't know because we it hasn't been that long, right? But what mm -hmm. we do know is that people who get coronavirus naturally and make a natural immune response, they are protected for almost a year. So we are hoping, hoping and praying to every Bhagawan that this will provide us at least one year. But I'm hoping we will have more than one year of protection. Okay, right. So, yeah, so all of us are hearing about the first wave of COVID, second wave, or maybe the third wave is coming up. So uh, what do you think about, like, how many waves are possible, you know, for COVID? And is the vaccine that we are getting is sufficient to handle all these waves? Yeah, the waves are nothing but, you know, just times when the vac uh, the uh, virus is more active. Sometimes the vi it may be a new variant of the virus. We don't know. Because uh, the, what we're hoping is if you have massive vaccination, right, if you get as many people vaccinated as possible, the wave is going to drop, right? Like it has, an, if you look in the United States, we had, uh, you know, a couple of little bumps. We, every time somebody goes out, like we had one in the beginning when nobody knew what it was. Then we had a second wave when in the summer, everybody was going out to the beach and partying and having a good time. Then we had another wave. Then we had another one when in, in, this, in, the, in the winter. Because we have Thanksgiving, we have Christmas, everybody was uh, you know, partying and having a good time. We had another wave. So those kinds of waves were happening because we had no vaccine, right? People were not protected. Now we've got the vaccine. So I am hoping no more waves, okay? That is the hope. Mm -hmm. Unless we, have, we got very unlucky and we got some terrible variants, which I hope we won't have, right? Mm -hmm. And we also talked about this issue of vaccine providing cross-protection, cross-protection. And this is known for other vaccines like you know that we have because even like if you have the flu vaccine you will have some protection next year even when there is a when there is a new variant right that's why in the flu in, i know in india you don't make a big deal about the flu but like for us flu is a big thing every year we go get a flu vaccine but not 100 only 40 percent to 50 percent of the people get vaccinated but that's enough to prevent like a massive wave you know where we have tons of tons of people we have people every year 20 to 80,000 people die from uh, flu every year. But because of the vaccines and the vaccine cross protection, we don't have a huge problem. So I'm, the same principle mm -hmm. is going to apply to coronavirus. I don't want you all to worry about third wave, fourth wave. Let's focus on second wave. Let's get through the second wave. Let's get our vaccines as soon as they're available. Again, sorry, I need to say this. Vaccines, which I did not mention. When you have a shortage of vaccines, please make sure that the vaccine is given to the highest risk people first. I'm, I'm very upset in Tamil Nadu when they opened it up for 18 years old and up. A lot of the young people went and got vaccinated. If you had 137 crore vaccines, please, everybody go get it. But now you're getting one lakh vaccine here, one lakh vaccine there, right? So please give it to the high risk people first. High risk people are the people that when they get coronavirus, they are going to be intubated in the ventilator in the ICU and who are going to die, right? These high risk people are people over the age of 60, very high risk people. If you are, so those are the first people. So the Nana, Dadi, Mama, you know, all those people need to go in first. And then after that, you'll have 45 and above. And then all the, and if the youngsters, now, unfortunately, we're having, hearing news reports of young people in India dying. You know, people in their 30s. And, for, and that is 
you know, we have very little here. If they are healthy, they should not have a problem. The reason that some of these young people are dying is unfortunately because of the lack of hospital care. You know, you may just be dehydrated from diarrhea and you may not be, all you need is maybe some drips, but your young person didn't get to go. Or you were a young person and you have, uh, just all you have is the oxygen is, oxygen is going down. All you need is just a mask with some oxygen, but you didn't have oxygen, right? So this is not Corona that is killing you. It is because lack of facilities. But if you are an older person, the chances of you, older or person with diabetes, high blood pressure, heart disease, lung disease, any of those, you are at much, much higher risk. So please, please, I beg of you, when you have a short supply of vaccine, don't you know kick out your nana and dadi and run there, go and get your vaccine first. I know a lot of people here in Successive, they're all going to be young people. So instead, as young people, please organize in your community to make sure that the people that need the vaccines get it first. And then go and get it yourself when you have plenty of vaccines. That was a long answer, but I wanted to make sure and give that uh, impart that to people that are watching. Right. So, doctor, when you say people at high risk, if if a young person ha is asthmatic, so do you think that is you know they are at a high risk of COVID? What are the effects of you know COVID on? Yeah, actually, uh, right now in the United States, again, it's very different because mm -hmm. of the levels of care. Because asthmatics here are very mm -hmm. well controlled. Maybe in India, an asthmatic sometimes they take their medicine, sometimes they don't take their medicine, sometimes they go to the doctor. Mm -hmm. I don't know, but asthmatics mm -hmm. actually have not shown a significant increase in coronavirus here in the United States. The biggest okay. biggest people throughout the world. Diabetes, 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 high blood pressure, high blood pressure, high blood pressure, heart disease, heart disease, heart disease, obesity, obesity, obesity. So even though you may think, oh, nothing is wrong with me, right? I don't know. I'm not taking any blood pressure. If you come to the United States and you see the young uh, people that are healthy and young that are dying is a big, big thing has been obesity. So what is obesity for Indians versus obesity for uh, uh, Caucasians, like Western, uh, Western uh, racial groups? In India, if your BMI, body mass index, you can all Google this. If your body mass index is over tw is 23, 23 or above, that is obesity in India. Okay. Uh, so it is very, very important that if you have that, that that is considered a risk factor. And that, so if you're a young person and you're trying to decide whether to take a vaccine or not, and you're like, ah, chalta hai vaccine, I don't need to take because, you know, I don't have diabetes, I don't have high blood pressure. But let's say your BMI, let's say you weigh, you weigh 180, uh, if you weigh 100 kgs, right? Even though if you don't have any other problems, then you are at higher risk uh, of, uh, it doesn't even need to be 100 kgs. Go check your BMI. If you're over 23, then you are at a, at a higher risk of uh, de uh, developing complications from COVID. Okay. Right. Here we are. Right. So, yeah, so somebody here asked that, you know, can COVID be transmitted through a fly? No, actually, COVID does not get transmitted through insects like dengue and some of the other things, you know, like malaria and all, they're getting transmitted through the mosquito. No, the COVID does not get transmitted that way through a fly or any other insect. It is person to person. For a whole year, we thought it was going through droplets. Like, you know, when you uh, when you sneeze or cough, there's a droplet of water. And inside that, there's the, uh, the virus. And these droplets are very heavy and they drop within like uh, one or two feet. They drop to the ground. OK, we thought mm -hmm. when you come close, these droplets land on your nose or on your mouth and then you get it. But now both the WHO and CDC are saying that that is still happening. But a big thing also, it is going through the air. OK, but it is not. Uh, so basically, what does that mean? Means we cannot get together in crowds in small spaces. Right. Yeah, I'm going to have a party today. I'm going to have. Uh, you know, um, a wedding party or birthday party and get into a small room and put all the people together. Or even in a large room, when you have a lot of people gathering together indoors and you put on your AC and you don't have good ventilation, then that's a problem. So those are, and then by touching, you know, by touching, not as much. It still can happen. So that's why we're still telling people to wash their hands. But that's not the major mode. So the major modes are an uh, airborne, you know, through, through, through the air. Mm -hmm. So if you have a huge, the main thing, Avoid crowds, avoid crowds, avoid crowds and try to stay far away from people if you are going to be in a situation where you have to be in a, in, in, with, with other people. And if you're going to get close to people, you know, less than six feet and stuff, you need to be wearing a mask. OK, and make sure that the mask is well fitted and the mask protects against droplets. OK, not a whole cloth mask, not a whole lot of protection against airborne, but you will get a lot of protection from the um, from the droplets bacteria. OK. 
So, uh, you know, somebody asked that, what do I do if I have COVID symptoms, but the test reports are negative? Ah, yes, yes. Very, 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 very good question. Because uh, the, no test is 100%, okay? And it also mm -hmm. depends on whether you got a, uh, an antigen, AG test, antigen test, or you got an RT-PCR mm -hmm. test, okay? Two very different tests. So if you got the antigen test there right now, especially even in India, even in the United States, there's tons of antigen tests and half of them are totally useless. They will show plus one time, negative one time, plus one time, negative one time. So we do not trust the antigen test itself. So if the antigen test comes back positive or negative, it doesn't matter. If in right now, if you have a fever, if you are having coughs, if you're having chills, if you're having body aches, body aches, and if it comes back negative, then we make sure we test for other things because one of the things that doctors, unfortunately, are now so focused on Corona, they forget that there are other diseases also there. You know, that's mm -hmm. one, of, one of the big problems we had in the United States. People stopped checking for and treating for flu. They're just only looking at the coronavirus. But flu is also mm -hmm. still there, right? Not as much, but still mm -hmm. there. So just mm -hmm. because your thing came negative, as a doctor, we should check for other things. If other things are negative, then even though your coronavirus antigen test was negative, we're going to treat you like you have coronavirus. So if you're at home, like in my family, unfortunately, several of people did not want to go get tested because they were afraid that if they came back positive, then the government was going to take them somewhere else to be quarantined away from their families. So they did not even want to be tested. So whether you test and you become negative or you don't test, but you in your head, that thought is coming. Ah, could this be coronavirus? You have that thought in your head. Please think it is coronavirus and do all the things I talked about earlier today. Take care of yourself at home. There is one case where the uh, uh, RT-PCR test can also be negative. And that is when the sampling is not done correctly. Or if it is done too early in the disease and or too late when the, it moves more to the lungs and you don't have much going on. So there's a couple of cases where even the RT-PCR can be negative and you may be positive. So that's why here, you know, this is what medicine is about. You don't treat the lab test. You don't treat the test report. You treat the patient. Okay. So if you're having symptoms and you're worried it might be COVID, doesn't matter what your tests are. Make sure you don't have some other horrible thing. I don't know if dengue and all are going around in India right now. Make sure it's none of those other things. Check with your doctor. If it's none of those other things, then treat yourself like you have COVID. Back okay. to you. So, uh, like, what are the side effects of some COVID mag you know, medicines that we are having here, like Evermectin or doxycycline? And I would repeat what I said. There is no medicine for <laughs> you. Should yeah. not be taking these medicines. Do not take these medicines. You know, one year ago we were giving these medicines because we were hoping mm -hmm. they would work. Now for a whole year, we've done many, many, many studies all over the world, not just in the United States, all over mm -hmm. the world. So please, please, please do not take these medicines. So don't worry about their side effects because you're not going to take those medicines. You are going mm -hmm. to take paracetamol if you have fever. You're going to take ORS if you have diarrhea. And you're going to drink mm -hmm. lots of water. And you're going to get some rest. And you're going to check your oxygen levels. You're going to check your blood pressure levels. You're going to check your sugars. That's what you're going to do. You are not going to be popping medicines that you read about on the internet, and you're not going to go to the pharmacist. You're not going to buy these medicines and take them randomly. Okay. Okay. Right. So uh, someone wanted to know what are the best practices that we can, you know, uh, adopt af uh, after COVID. Yeah. Maybe think, after, yeah. Once after you've got yeah. And the mm -hmm. thing again, uh, one thing I think uh, in relation to that, somebody is also talking about what kind of food we should eat. And I, I didn't yeah. mention that. There is no special diet. This is, I think, culturally, we Indians, we want one vegetable or one kashayam or uh, kashayam is a double word. Sorry, I don't know what the Hindi word of that is. But like an herbal drink or something. Mm -hmm. Somebody wants something, uh, you know, in their diet. Whatever you normally do, if you normally eat a healthy diet, that is what is going to be most important. So, try, you know, what is a healthy diet? You're trying to avoid fried foods, deep fried foods, you know, very heavy foods. And you want your food to not have all only carbohydrates, you know, uh, packaged foods, opening up packages of biscuits and noodles and whatnot. Trying to eat healthy, lots of fruits, lots of vegetables, because that's what has all the vitamins that you need. So please don't be popping in huge amounts of vitamin tablets. 
okay unless you have a, unless your doctor has said you have a vitamin deficiency like you have a vitamin d deficiency and they have given that to you otherwise don't be popping vitamins just to, you know normal lots of vegetable sabzi and all of those you eat them and after you come back from covid if you are still if your stomach is still not feeling that good then just eat some bland foods don't eat a lot of spicy food make sure well hydrated again after covid it's the symptoms can be very very different somebody may go through covid like this and they, they in in 5 10 days are perfectly fine but if you were in the hospital if you were in the icu if you were ventilated and you come out to leave you had covid pneumonia what is pneumonia pneumonia is when the infection goes into your lung right it doesn't matter whether the pneumonia was from covid or the whether it was from a bacteria or from some other virus like the flu it's always the same so it's not suddenly we have this new virus that is totally different from everything else it is different but if my patient had pneumonia from some other flu pneumonia let's say before corona he still are going to take months months to feel normal okay and that you have to work with your doctor so the biggest thing is we have also in india that if you're sick means you need to be on bed rest that's about the worst thing to do is bed rest unless your doctor says you are too weak you cannot even for the weakest of weak patient unless you are unconscious here we make the patient get up get up and go to the chair get up and go to the bathroom with the help of somebody safely with your doctor so bed rest is not recommended for any type of recovery you also need to be patient because you may feel very weak for months especially if you had pneumonia you did not have pneumonia you'll be fine in a you know a couple of weeks or so but i remember i taught you the breathing exercises but this breathing exercise may seem very simple but is actually really good for expanding your lungs strengthening your diaphragm and overall getting you back in shape and improving the strength of your lungs so breathing exercises and also starting exercises i just now finished treating a patient in india uh, with covid at home and i i said now and then i told him after he was done i said now you need to start on the treadmill he said hey you treadmill i'm not ready to do treadmill yet i said no you have to get on the treadmill you will put it on the lowest speed you will go for 5 minutes you will hold on to the handles you're not going to be going like this in the treadmill you're not going to be running on the treadmill but you need to get your body moving okay make sure you check with your doctor if you have other medical problems obviously if you have heart disease and all of that you don't be doing anything without talking to your doctor i'm talking about people that are healthy and are okay otherwise you need to start moving in a couple of weeks and stuff get on your treadmill go for a walk if you have a terrace go for a walk and start moving that is very and start doing your breathing exercises to improve your lungs back to you ria So someone from the chat here wanted to ask that you know as we know that uh, covid is airborne so people are getting really paranoid here even stepping out of the balcony I or maybe to the windows uh, when the neighbors are you know covid I positive know. so is it really unsafe i we, no, we want to no. and you know the thing is it's not like when you step out of the house there is a corona soup hanging out over here a cloud of corona that you're going into it's not like that it's not like that let me tell it be, because so the infection it is not as infectious as like some of the other airborne diseases one disease that many people don't realize is airborne is measles okay so measles is very 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 infectious now so if you had if nobody was infected for measles and you go into a room and one person has measles just stepping into the room you will have you will get measles okay it is that infectious but with coronavirus that's not the case because if it was then all of us partying around and going around and going to the beach and going to all of this we would all be infected kids have been going to school right in the united states we've been all going to the states and they've been wearing masks but the mask is only for droplet but no they're not all getting horribly sick people are going to work in 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 the united states before the vaccine well before the vaccine uh, they're being careful uh, wearing their masks so they don't get droplets falling on them they're washing their hands and they're trying to stay far away so putting the cubicles and all far away and then now making sure ventilation is available you know good filtration systems or if you don't have good filtration systems open up the windows but then you know you don't want people dying of heat stroke either you know if you have a patient elderly patient and you have a, you have ventilation and you have trying to decide you know it's better to wear a mask so it's not like you should not absolutely should not be terrified to step out of their house okay now if there's a big mela going outside the obviously you don't want to be going and joining the mela in the house but uh, outside the house which my parents and all did they were like oh no no we are watching the mela from the house right 
but the house of the mela was two feet away mela was two feet away the the procession was going obviously you don't want to be in situations like that you know but my father poor fellow he was wearing the mask the whole time in the house no reason for that it does not help okay so no need to wear a mask in the house because ordinary masks and stuff don't protect you uh, but at the same time it's not like as soon as you take if you don't wear anything that you're naked and you're surrounded by corona it's not like that go outside go for a little walk if there's no people around go for a you know go to go to your garden and walk around go to your terrace and walk around and if you're if you are talking to your neighbor and he's uh, out there you know 6 feet away 10 feet away have a nice conversation with him if you have a little doggy take your little dog out for a walk we have had almost a normal lifestyle here because for first of all there's not that many people in the us right whereas in india there's much more crowds so as long as you can avoid the crowds if you're going out and there's only like three or four people and they're all 10 feet away don't worry then you can wave at them you can have a chat you can kya baat hai aap kaise hai you do your little chat right you need this mental you need you what the last thing you want to do is end up in this isolation and you get this mental depression or mental anxiety and panic and we have had lots of suicides in in the united states during the pandemic because of people getting severe mental illness and somebody had asked a question about that and i unfortunately i didn't have time because it's a huge you know mental mental health maintaining your mental health is a very big thing i will um, ria i will send you some information uh, about a uh, a line a uh, hotline called sukh dukh sukh dukh you can look it up on uh, online as well it is done by pallium india which is a wonderful wonderful organization it is a who organiz- uh, training center in india and they are providing mental health uh, services so if you are you know scared or if somebody died in your family or somebody is very sick with covid please go ahead and call them uh, because this can really g- get in your head and get really depressed so i what i have done during this whole time never been inside the house i go out safely obviously i'm not going in packed areas i'm going out taking a walk where you know uh, uh, meeting our neighbors in the yard in the garden we're meeting our neighbors putting them you know at a distance they're sitting in chairs away from us we're sitting further away from us still having a good good conversation very very important to maintain human connections during this time because you have to talk to people i don't know how the delhi culture is but tamil culture people are very secretive if they have covid they don't want to tell anybody because they think that they will think badly of them and i'm trying to tell my family are this is when you need your family's help this is when you need your family support but what they're saying is when they say i have covid then the family is like are yeah yeah obviously you went around to the cinema theater you are going to get covid of course you went to the back you know they're finding blame mm-hmm. anybody can get covid so if you mm-hmm. find out that your family is positive for covid please don't judge them and tell them ah you did this this is why you got covid instead you say oh ria i'm so sorry how can i help you what can i do is there something that i can uh, you know maybe i can get food for you or maybe i can find out uh, hospital beds or maybe i can find out where where they're selling a pulse oximeter so be a connection be a help to each other instead of bringing people down and making them scared that oh i can't tell anybody don't isolate people be a community that's what we as indians are known for is our social connections so let's use the social mm-hmm. connections during time like this and let's not be afraid go back to right. you so uh, also i wanted to ask like uh, you know we have heard about a lot of vaccines like covaxin covishield and there's pfizer and sputnik so is, is is it like you know one vaccine is better than the other especially in india we have you know covaxin and covishield so people right. are really confused which one to get right right a very very good question right now we still you know whatever vaccine if you can get covaxin or covishield and you're a high risk pa- person please go get whichever vaccine is offered to you because we've not had any vaccine signals show up that oh this vaccine is very mm-hmm. unsafe we don't have anything like that covi shield mm-hmm. i've already told you we have the data one out of 1 lakh right one out of 1 lakh is the number of people who get clots i do not have a number like that for covaxin but i have not you know so hopefully in in uh, in june is what i've heard that the government is planning on releasing some data but right now you know india is struggling to just take care of the patients right so they don't have time i'm hoping they have are collecting data but it might be a while before we get real data 
Uh, Sputnik is the third one. I think it was recently approved in India. Now, again, Sputnik, we don't know because it has not been given to millions of people like Covishield has been. It, the data that the Sputnik company uh, published in Lancet shows that they are very effective. Just you know, all of these vaccines are between 80 to 90 percent effective. And all of these vaccines are almost 100 percent in preventing death and reducing severity of disease, you know? So all mm -hmm. of these vaccines. So e effectiveness is whether you turn positive or not. Who cares if I turn positive right now, right? And I just have, you know, I'm just like, oh, I, I want to sit in bed. It's okay, you can sit in bed for a few days. The main thing is you don't want to be in the hospital. You don't want to be on oxygen. You don't want to die. And all of these vaccines help with that, right? Now Sputnik, uh, 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 the, uh, Brazil refused Sputnik. They actually sent back their Sputnik. Uh, so I, this is not to scare you, but to tell you what is happening because there were some problems with the uh, quality control because they were being produced somewhere else and they were sent to Brazil and they found out that the vaccines did not were not working the same as the batch that they reported in Lancet. Okay, so but India is making its own Sputnik. I think Dr. Reddy's Pharmaceuticals is making its own Sputnik in India, which is, so it's not coming from somewhere else. So I'm really hoping that those quality control problems that Brazil had with Sputnik, we are not going to have in India, okay? Because it is being made locally. So hopefully all the leaders and scientists will have their eyes peeled to make sure that the Indian people are getting the safest possible vaccine for them. Right, right. So uh, so somebody wanted to ask that, is there anybody that, you sh that should not take a COVID-19 vaccine? Yeah, right now there's almost almost no contraindication contraindication means you cannot take this vaccine uh because uh, even if you've been allergic to something else before like when we're saying allergic means not just you know coughing or sneezing allergies we're talking about allergic where your tongue swells up and you can't breathe right that type of allergy that's anaphylactic allergy even for those people we have been able to safely give the vaccines the main thing is you need to tell your doctor and the person who's giving the vaccine beforehand that, hey, I let's say you're allergic to penicillin, okay, that you were in the past, sometimes somebody gave you penicillin and you, you had a very bad reaction and you almost died. You can still get the vaccine. You just need to let the person know. So right now for, uh, for uh, Pfizer and Moderna, we, stay, uh, we need to be watching the patients for 15 to 30 minutes after, after you get the vaccine to make sure you don't get any allergic reaction. But if we know that this person has a severe allergy to something else, then we keep the patient there for 30 minutes to one hour. So we are there for longer. And we make sure that we have all the medicines ready so that in case they have something, we can immediately take care of them. We've not had anybody die of an allergic reaction. Okay. So uh, you definitely, we are also giving it to everybody, even like cancer patients, uh, rheumatology patients, kidney patients. All of those patients have been able to safely get the vaccine. Always, of course, talk to your doctor so they can monitor you very closely, right? Mm -hmm. uh, there are some patients, for example, who have a lot of autoimmune reactions. And that is bigger problem with Pfizer and those types of things which generate a big autoimmune thing. But with something like Covishield, if your doctor is more worried, let's say if you're a younger person and you're worried about clots and things like that, again, one mm -hmm. in one lakh, but even then that is still there, you need to be aware of it. So if you have clots, okay, what are the things, that, what does a small clot do? Main things like we already talked about, chest pain, difficulty breathing, any type of paralytic type thing, headache, you know, that the, there's a clot in the brain, severe headache, blurred vision, slurred speech, anything where you're thinking, oh, am I getting a stroke? Anything like that, okay? Please call your doctor. Most of these things happen within the first two to three weeks. If you're going to have any problems, it happens within the first two to three weeks. So, you know, we now we've had vaccines for six months and we're still not seeing any major issues. If there's going to be, maybe then some two years later, we'll find out that very rare people got something possible, but that's very, 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 very rare. Right now in six months, the safety signal for these vaccines, all of these vaccines in general is very, very good. So I, I would not say that there's somebody that you should not take it even if you have an hour. Back to you. Okay, so lastly, I would uh, like to ask you that, you know, if someone has survived COVID and it's been like six months uh, and, you know, they have developed antibodies, I believe. Mm -hmm. So is it required that they should take a vaccine or is it fine if they don't? 
Yeah. So we remember we were talking about that now. Uh, if you are six months out and you're fully vaccinated and you have antibodies, then in a shortage, because there is a shortage, right? right? If there was no shortage, we would not be having this conversation. Because mm -hmm. there is a shortage, please wait. Please wait until other people who have no protection can get it. And then you can go get it. When once there is plenty, see, as I told you, right now we have good evidence that this is protecting, giving you some level. Several, I, I cannot tell you, oh, if you get COVID, you will never get COVID again. That is, I cannot mm -hmm. say that because there are some people, again, very small, very, very small number of people who are getting reinfected with COVID, okay? But they are not dying and they are not, you know, very, you know, in, except in extremely rare cases, uh, they, are, they don't get severe disease, right? So mm -hmm. if you have antibodies right now, which means you have some protection. So please think about community at large right now when we are in a shortage and wait for your vaccine until other people who have no antibodies get their vaccine and then you can go get your vaccine when we have plenty of them. All right. Very good. Very good. I think we're doing all right. We're, 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 we're way past time. We've kept, kept all these people past eight o'clock. Sorry about that. But I, I'm glad we were able to answer some of the questions. And um, do you have anything else, Ria, or can we uh, wrap up now? No, I think we can wrap up now. And uh, on behalf of everybody, I would like to thank you so much, Dr. Sue, that you took out time and, you know, uh, guided us on how to deal with the situation mentally also. And, uh, you know, you gave us such good information about the vaccines as well. I think that was really required in these times. So thank you so much for taking out time uh, again this year. Thank you. It's a pleasure. It's a pleasure, Ria. And I want to say thank you to all of these people that watched today. And, and just a reminder to you, because we talked about so many different things, this particular video will be available on, on recording. Please share it with your family and friends who are not able to join today. And also, please go to Health Secure, all one word, healthsecure.org. And, all, and go to COVID uh, India there. And there you will see, uh, the. you can print out uh, what kind of medicines you need to have, what kind of devices you need to have, when do you need to go to the hospital. And also, if there were questions here that were not answered, please, uh, you can go directly to my website, which is suroyapamd.com. I'm gonna go and type in there in the chat right now. And also Ria, if you can send this to other people, I can't see that, yeah. Send it to other people as well. You can contact me uh, through suroyapamd.com uh, or through healthsecure.org anyway. And I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you again. And I wish you all the very, very best. Please know that the entire world, world and the, and the United States, all of us are praying for you. We are supporting you. You are getting, you know, just tons and tons of donations are going out from here. Sometimes even more than the monetary things and the material things. You need to know that we are with you guys. We have gotten over this. We know what this fear is like because we went through all of this just a few months ago. And now we are in a much better place. And I know for a fact that India will be in a better place soon. So namaskar, danyavad. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.